applause for Mr. Michael Angelo Badio. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Uh, I love to play in California, whether it's Los Angeles, San Diego. It's such a, Southern California is such a great place to perform. There's so many big bands and big artists that are from here all the way up to LA and, and obviously San Francisco as well. Anyway, this is a Dean workshop. Gary Harrison uh, is a really good friend of mine, uh, plus he's super knowledgeable about Dean guitars. After the clinic, if you have any questions on any of the guitars, he's a really good one to ask. Um, I like to do a more concert clinic type environment. I think the best way to talk about Dean guitars is to shut up and play Dean guitars. <laughs> now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play two songs in a row. I might talk just a tiny bit between each song, but uh, the guitar that I'm playing is called the Speed of Light. Uh, every one of these guitars on stage, except for the Dane Mus Dave Mustaine one there, uh, is one of my signatures, and they vary in prices. Um, there's some that are like in the $300 range that are on the front, they're beautiful. Um, there's some that are more with the AMG pickup systems, but I love Dean guitars. It's not just a guitar company for me, it's a passion. It's what I really used, and uh, um, it's what I wanted to use even before I became a quote, uh, known guitar player, unquote. Anyway, no more talk. I'm gonna play, I'm gonna start off with my tribute to Randy Rhodes, and then I'm going to play one of my songs. But first, I must assume the shred position. Excuse me. I'm ready! We're going to do it. Hold on. They hooked up. Dunlap doesn't want to work. So we're going to play like men with no effects whatsoever. All right, sometimes stuff happens. One carbon copy is enough.
Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, what, what happened to me in the beginning of this clinic is an important lesson in performing. Um, one, stuff happens, okay? It happens all the time. Uh, the first thing you check is a cable, because 99% of the time it was a cable. Um, with this, everything was working perfectly in the sound check. Um, something play, I don't know. Um, but the, everything was fine with the setup. Once I unplugged it, it worked. But the first thing I thought is, what is the weak link in the signal chain? A pedal that I've not used before. Uh, so I just checked it. Because like, if you have something through an effects loop, pull it out. Okay, so that means that your signal's going. I only, I don't use a lot of pedals. It's not that I don't like them, uh, but I can get my tone almost anywhere. A lot of the videos, videos that you see on YouTube, I have thousands and tens and tens of millions of views, but many of the videos are with a guitar I've never played before through an amp I've never played before either, and the same as tonight. Um, the strap isn't mine. You can buy this. This guitar is for sale. It's from here at Pitbull Audio. The cable, you can buy it. I brought an overdrive and my double guitar and a second overdrive with a cable. That's all I have. So everything is from the store. Also, so what? I have no delay. I'm playing Mojave Desert. Here's my tone tonight. That's it, baby. If you hear a mistake, so what? <laughs> anyway. Um, now, but that's it, and I, I don't care. I, you know, you make the, I, I have, you know, when I first started playing guitar, I used to be really freaked out. Like if I had a bad show, like, oh, I suck, yeah! You know, I'd be depressed for a week. Now, I look at it and say, I do the best that I can. I do 110% every time I play. I don't care if it's a huge crowd, a small crowd, any, I mean, I played for 20,000 people in the last year, and I do guitar workshops, and I love each and every moment of play. Now, no more talk. Here is my song called No Boundaries. Um, I've released 12 solo records. That doesn't even count the two major label bands that I was on, and I happened to be on Warner Brothers Records uh, for both of the bands. Early in my career, in my early 20s, a band called Holland, that's not very well known, but, but they were, so, yeah, they were such, we were such a great band. Um, we wrote three and a half minute pop songs. That's my school, you know, when you think of Cheap Trick, I mean, look at bands like Enough's Enough. Um, it was very melodic music, and I wrote every song with the lead singer, and it was good enough to get signed to Atlantic. And then when I got into Nitro, um, I was a guitarist that could do things that other guitarists couldn't do at the time. And so the label exploited it. You know, they never heard a guitar player play fast like me or play two guitars at the same time and do all this crazy stuff. So they exploited it to the max. So they took what we did to the extreme, and I'm proud of it. Um, and, and also sometimes typecast you, but so what? Uh, but after Nitro alone, 12 solo records. Um, this song, No Boundaries, is really special to me because I never even thought I'd play it. Um, it was designed to help guitar players. Um, here are some of the people that I taught. I taught Tom Morella from Rage Against the Machine personally. Um, John Petrucci studied my instructional video and told me he started using the Jazz 3 pick because of me. I have a new signature pick coming out that's even better than the Jazz 3. It's going to be coming out really soon. Um, I love these picks, but I like a small teardrop-shaped pick. When I, when I was a little kid, I didn't like the Fender-style picks, and I had no idea why. I always I used to use mandolin picks when I was a little guy. I hated those big Fender-style picks. I just didn't like them, but now I know why. Um, it's accuracy. Uh, they're pointed, they're teardropped, they're small. Um, I, I have a new pick coming out. It's a 1.3 millimeter. It's even better than the Jazz 3. But I had people like John Petrucci study my instructional videos. I had Michael Romeo from Symphony X study my instructional videos. Um, newer guitar players like Herman Lee, he told me he made his career out of studying my instructional videos with all the stuff that he took from my, my things. Dimebag told me, he goes, you like my guitar teacher, man. And so I have Mark Tremonti. I just saw him at uh, the Roxy a couple nights ago. Um, I work with him a lot on guitar solos. So I'm kind of like the teacher to the stars. And the reason why my stuff has been so successful is because I've never once in my life said, play like Mikey. See, we have so many differences as guitar players. And I'm going to say this uh, unequivocally. The guitar audience on the internet is, is not really friendly. And it's really sad. You know, you know, here I've been a columnist for Guitar World for over five years. The hatred that guitar players put amongst each other 
is unparalleled. Drummers are pretty friendly guys. They're sitting in the back. Do you get guitar players on a forum? It's it's acidic. It, it's it's like toxic. And and I don't know why. But I can tell you this: I don't care. Um, because if they don't want to listen to what I have to say, then let them do whatever they want. But I made studies of guitar players, and I found things that we have so many differences as players. We only have a few things that are similar. Similar. That's what makes the electric guitar the most popular instrument in the world. And that's one of the things that I really wanted to do. I wanted to help the guitar community. So I don't care if people online say, oh, this sucks, this sucks. Let them think it sucks. They're the people I don't have to worry about. you got to worry about people like me who never post anything online practicing i'm like yeah yeah you know i'm writing songs i'm doing clinics you know i'm figuring out if something doesn't work fix it and so but here's what i did i wrote songs to teach see i make my points complex points simple that's teaching teaching's not talking about big words i have a degree in music i can talk about color pointillism stretto and counterpoint i can talk about all this stuff renaissance counterpoint versus baroque counterpoint i know all this stuff that's not being a good teacher teaching you is teaching you stuff that you can learn that you can use um just something as a simple a minor arpeggio i got to be the first guitarist on the planet to put it on a video um it was new and then, and then I love Marty Friedman to death, but he's very critical of certain styles. And I think to myself, that's such a wrong way to think. It doesn't mean that, it, that he doesn't have success. But when you criticize a technique, what you're saying to yourself is, maybe I don't play that technique good. I don't want to play that technique good. And then what happens if you are hired and you have to play a riff with that technique and you can't do it? See, I always thought of myself as I wanted to be the guitarist that's the first violinist in a symphony orchestra. A technique is a technique, and sometimes people can't differentiate between an instructional video, a program, and music. And so you get your whole career judged by an arpeggio. And so, and this is the thing that I really want to stress in a workshop. Techniques are a means to an end. I only teach how to play. It's up to you to use that to your ability. Um, a technique can be popular, it can be not popular, but you never know. And I have a saying, it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. And so here we go. Here is my song, No Boundaries. It has no song structure whatsoever. <laughs> it's song, part A, B, C, D, E, F, G, because it was made to show what I was going to teach in the video Speed Kills. Now, excuse me, I must assume the shred position again. <laughs> ready.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to talk about one Dean Guitar and Dorsey. Um, Dean is a huge company. It's a global company. When that big crash of the economy in 2008 happened, you know how many employees Dean laid off? None. Because the owner of the company is one of the coolest people on planet Earth. He drives Lamborghinis and Ferraris, and he's a great, great musician. He will help me carry my equipment. I've seen him load gear in trucks. He does, he leads because people want to work for him. Um, you know, there's two kinds of leaders. There's the dictators that force you to, to work with them, and there are leaders who you want to be uh, a part of. And Elliot uh, is that person. Um, he's really an incredible human being. He's totally cool. He's the nicest guy on the planet. He can switch gears between talking about real estate. I mean, he holds these vast holdings of real estate, all this stuff. I mean, he rents space to just, I mean, it's crazy what the guy does in business, but then you just hang out with him and he's a bro. I mean, I, my double guitar in the case weighs about 40, well, weighs exactly 44 pounds. And, you know, we're, I mean, I've seen him multiple times helping me carry my luggage. I mean, some leaders don't do that. They don't want to do that. They don't want to look like that. Elliot does the things that he expects other people to do. And he's a great, great bass player. Um, I love all kinds of music. Um, you know, I grew up in, in the generation, you know, listening to Led Zeppelin. I came up in the 80s in L.A. But I don't just listen to that music. I was talking earlier. I mean, one of the CDs I was listening to on the way down, well, it's not a CD, it's on my iPod, was, was Five Finger Death Punch's latest record. Jack O'Leary Night! Or that song, F it! I, I love it. I mean, there's so many songs, you know, I got your six. I just love, I love new music because guitar players in the 21st century, especially um, after about 2003 or 2004, were exponentially better. I mean, the 90s was the era of the non-guitar and rock music. I mean, I love Kurt Cobain, and I, I love listening to Nirvana songs, the melodic, the way the melodies are, the melodic contours, the way the chords are really different. But when Kurt Cobain played a lead, it bent my ears. I could not stand it. It's like, it's honestly, it sucks so bad. I, I was listening to one yesterday, I'm like, yeah, Cobain! You know, I couldn't take it. It's so out of tune and bad. That doesn't mean he's not a great artist. That doesn't mean he d he's not a great songwriter, great singer, a great personality as a guitar player. But then you listen to all these new bands. There are so many great metal bands coming. Five Finger Death Punch is a great example. Just listen to Octane on Sirius XM. The guy rips on guitar. He's a really excellent guitar player, great rhythm player, a great lead player. That's what new metal is about. These guys can play and girls. They can play and they can sing. And you know, so you hear everybody going, Whoa! but they also do a lot more. And it's something that, you know, when people say, oh, back in the old days, it was so much better. Well, I have managed things in my office. I love, I got over 150 guitars in my collection, a lot of them Dean's, but a lot of them are old guitars, old Fenders, old Gibsons. I've got stuff from the 1930s in my collection, um, a four string tenor guitar. And so, but I learned this that I also have my dad's cell phone from the 80s. It's as big as a car battery! The antenna's 10 feet long! And it's the opposite of Zoolander. You know Zoolander was like, hello. You know they have phones this big? The receiver is this big! It's like, hello! And so how awesome was that to walk around with a car battery and a 10 foot long antenna? Hello? Wasn't that awesome? I mean, there were a lot of great things about the past, and I never want to discount that, because my dad always said a great line. He said, don't reinvent the wheel. And here's another thing. If you don't learn from the past, see, why, why do kids in school, um, guitar is the most popular instrument in the world. There's no question about it, especially the electric guitar. But you had electric and acoustic. It is by far, Dean guitars is everywhere. I played in the jungles of Borneo, for Dean guitars. I played in China 11 times, although only a couple were for Dean because I've done a lot of concerts. I've been in 58 countries. Every one of those countries has Dean guitars there. They are a global big boy bad company. And uh, here's why, what I'm saying is that when you listen to other styles of music, you listen to, you know, people play clarinet, they can play the flute, they can play all these things. 
There's one sound that each of those instruments get. Now, a clarin like a saxophone can get clean and it can get really gritty and nasty, which is cool. That's one of the only ones that can do that. Piano can't do that unless it's a keyboard with the electronic. You hit a note, it's either, it's, a, it's called really the pianoforte. A piano, piano, it's like pianissimo. Piano means soft. Forte means loud. So the real name for a piano is pianoforte because it's loud and soft because you can hit a key soft, you can hit it hard. But if anyone in this room plays piano, I'd play piano, um, and you play, the only thing that separates the tone is the skill level. But see, on guitar, it's different because um, if I can do this on a piano and someone can't, then I make a piano sound better, but I can't make it sound different. Every person in this room can pick up this guitar this cable, this amp, and sound like you. That's what makes guitar absolutely amazing. Now, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about one guitarist in particular. When I was in the band Nitro, uh, our first album, which I produced, was really popular. Um, it was called OFR. Uh, it was so far gone. I mean, um, the record company president told me, Michael, I want you to overplay all the time. So every, like when I remember when I play a solo that was slower than he thought, he's like, I thought you were fast, Angelo. I want to hear fast. I'm like, wah! I went, you know that old commercial, gotta make the donuts, gotta make the donuts. I was like, gotta play fast guitar, fast guitar. I mean, every solo he went, wow! And I did it. And then I got 29 fret guitars, 36 fret guitars, seven string guitars. I'm like, I can do this! And I mean, I was like, whoa! And we had to drive from Woodland Hills where we lived down to Costa Mesa to record. Every day was like a 50 mile drive. And so, you know, down that 405, it sucked. And so, but we did it every single day we recorded. And I, I was proud of it, it's so over the top, but that was analog tape. There's no editing. You, you know what an editing is in analog? You cut the tape. Those solos were one shot, that's it. The only time you could take a break is if there was a pause in the music. So it was played like I'm playing here today. It's just real in your face. And, and I really enjoyed doing that. Um, but when I was in the band Nitro, um, our first album did really, really well. And then we started hanging out with guys like CC DeVille and Steven Adler and we were, you know, we were like the dudes in LA and you know, we had our bodyguards, which really weren't our bodyguards, we didn't pay them. We, we worked out at Gold's Gym in Venice. And if you see these old videos of me, I was like a pencil, like people ask, I have this Gold's Gym t-shirt on, but they don't realize, see, it, it's easy to see 1992 or 91 through 2015 eyes. But see, back then, people were just thinner in general. And so, and I'm not saying that as a, a derogatory statement, it's just the way it is. You cannot look at the past through present eyes because it doesn't work. Because if this wasn't the year 2015, it was the year 1815, all of us would have a completely different view of a lot of things. And so, but it's easy to be hindsight as 2020. So when you see these videos of me, I'm 6'1", I was 148. But when I took off my shirt, I was ripped. I mean, I was just absolutely ripped. But I was, I look at it today, I look like my legs are about as big as my arms. I'm like, whoa! And people always come and, dude, what's the Gold's Gym t-shirt? We worked out at Gold's, we had a Gold's Gym endorsement. And so what we did was, when, uh, when we were doing all this stuff, our, our label, you know, we were, we were just like, we were like LA party guys and not really doing drugs or drinking, but we were hanging out with the Trey Chic everybody. And so our label said, look it, we're gonna give you all this money to do your second album. And we want you to record in Orlando, Florida. Like, Orlando, this sucks! We're like, it's Disney World, we're a metal band! We can record in Disney World! And so they said, you're going there. And they worked out a deal with this beautiful studio outside of Orlando called Full Sail Center of the Recording Arts, which is still there today. It was a multi-million dollar studio. So we moved the entire crew the singer and I, Jim, flew, of course. Uh, we had a big van and with the road crew with all our gear, drove from LA all the way to Orlando, Florida, cross country, and we moved into this big, huge, awesome house in Orlando. It was off International Drive and I-4, and we go there, and it was fully furnished. We had our agent, you know, take care of everything, you know, you know, the label paid for. We just went down there, you know, they said it was amazing. We go there, and we walk in this house. It's freaking gorgeous. And we walk outside to 
to the back, and there's this built-in pool, like many pools here in Southern California, except it was enclosed with screens. We're like, dude, what's up with the screens, bro? And my guitar tech at the time was from Fresno. He'd never seen snow. He'd never seen nothing uh, east of the Rockies until we toured. And all of a sudden, this gigantic bug flies by. It's like, whoa, dude, what is that, dude? And I go, dude, and I'm from Chicago, so I've seen bugs. And I said, dude, they call it in Florida a flying palmetto bug. And Jim Gillette, our senior, goes, yeah, dude, it's an effing cockroach with wings, dude. And my, my text's like, dude, man, this is like Jurassic Park out here, bro. This sucks, dude. He goes, I want to go back to L.A. We all wanted to go back to L.A. There's no screens. We don't need screens here in Southern California. We don't get a lot of bugs here. Well, we get bugs, but it's not the kind, like, you know, little mosquitoes flying. It's too dry. It's too dry. They can't live. Well, in Florida, it's like the forest primeval. And so all of a sudden, there's bugs everywhere. We needed a screen around our pool so we didn't get bit by mosquitoes and die from malaria or encephalitis or something. We're like, this sucks, dude. And so all of a sudden, we're recording off. We're doing our record. People are going out to the pool because we feel protected because we have the screens. I mean, literally, it's above, all around us, a screen protecting the swimming pool from bugs. And so this is Florida. And what happened was my guitar tech always introduced me to new music. And he goes up to me, he goes, Michael, man, I got this new band, bro. You got to hear this. You got to hear this, dude. And I'm like, well, what are they called, dude? He goes, dude, they're called Pantera, bro. I'm like, Pantera? What's a Pantera? He goes, check it out, dude. And he puts in the cassette. <laughs> I hit play, <laughs> winds up, and I hear, <laughs> I could not help myself. The power of metal compelled me. The index finger started to move higher in the air, defiant of all that is not metal. The little pinky followed, and I'm like, I don't want to like it, but I like it. And I'm listening to him go, wow, this thing just kicks you know what. And he's like, dude, man, you don't understand, bro. I'm like, what, bro? He goes, dude, they're playing in Orlando in like two weeks. I'm like, no way. He's like, way. I'm like, no way. Way. No way. Way. No way. Way. I'm like, way. Way. Cool. Let's go. So we go to see this brand new band that nobody knows about called Pantera. So the posse, see, Nitro was, we always had it dialed in. Our singer, Jim. He's something, he's an amazing human being. Um, there's no no for him. There's no, he doesn't, and I'm the same way. We had a saying, you can't soar with the eagles if you hang out with turkeys. You hang out with birds that don't fly, you ain't gonna soar. We don't want turkeys around us. So we were very, and it's not that we're better or cooler than anybody, but you are who you hang with. You are what you do. You can be a good person, but your deeds really are what dictates who you are. You know, you can think it's, I don't, I'm awesome, I care, I do this, I do that, but it's what you do is that makes you. And so it's not, you know, what's inside is important, but it's what is outside and what you emanate outside that's supreme, that's what you're judged by. So what we did is we, we knew the biggest bodybuilders, we always went to the local gym, and, you know, we used to think, especially in Orlando, it was so far behind Los Angeles. Back then, there was L.A. and everywhere else, uh, as far as music, as far as I was concerned, the rock. I mean, you, it was such a huge difference. It's not the same anymore with the Internet. So anyway, we go to watch Pantera. We had the full band, the full crew, and our couple bodybuilding buddies. So the posse goes in. We knew beforehand there was hardly any cars in the parking lot into this club called Plus Three. It's not around anymore. We knew all the hot bartenders because they were all really hot babes working there. And, and uh, you know, we'd go in and scope it out. We knew the local places because, you know, we used to hang out there after we recorded. And we walk in, there's nobody there. There's more people in the Nitro Entourage than in the rest of the club. It is absolutely empty to see Pantera. And all of a sudden, I'm like, yeah, man, they're going to suck. You know, they, they can't pull off this record. And all of a sudden, I walk out. Walks, this guy walks out, and he comes out to stage left. This is stage left, audience right. And this dude's got a pink beard. He's got these long shorts on. And I'm from L.A., man. The Lakers and the Celtics back then didn't have those shorts. They had the short shorts. Y-M-C-A. So look at Larry Bird. He didn't have long shorts. He had short shorts. That's what we were talking about. And so I'm thinking, this guy looks really weird, man. He's got these long shorts. He's got this long beard. What the heck is going on? And so all of a sudden, they start going, doo 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 
and I'm hearing this music and it happens again. I'm like, oh no, no, no. And I started listening. I'm going, God, these guys are rad. And so what I did is I walked up about 10 feet away from the stage, nobody around me. I'm standing there like this, watching this pink bearded, long shorted guitar player. And I'm like, listen, and I'm just like, nobody's around me. Like, I don't care how hot the babes are, I'm watching this band, yes. And so the music stops and Dime goes like this. He puts his eyes, he does this, he goes, is that Michael Angelo? I'm like, yeah, bro! He goes, dude, he goes, I got your instructional video, dude. He goes, you're like my guitar teacher, bro. I'm like, awesome, dude. And he goes, Pantera's gonna dedicate a set to Michael Angelo. And from that day on, Dime and I became friends. And I didn't know that he studied my stuff. I think he's one of the most amazing guitarists that's ever lived, just his tone. Uh, he changed the way people looked at guitar, that smiley face EQ, we're dropping the mids, I think bass and treble. Um, he was amazing, his riffs, everything. But I thought this, um, he was supposed to play on one of my records called Hands Without Shadows. His next tour stop was my hometown of Chicago, which is where I live again. I got a couple places, but, but Chicago's my main uh, hub right now. And he didn't make it. And, and it was just something that blew my mind. I know his brother Vinny really well. He's a D drum in Dorsey. D drum is owned by Elliot, the owner of Dean Guitars, like Luna, like Billy said. But I thought if Dime and Pantera could dedicate music to me, I want to dedicate music to a friend and a, the, probably the greatest Dean in Dorsey ever. So here's my humble tribute to the coolest metal guy that I've ever met. Here's my tribute to Dime.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I haven't said much about Dean guitars because I think the best way, like I said, to talk about them is just go. <laughs> not my guitar. It's not my amp. They rule. I can kick the you know what out of these guitars. I show guitars no mercy. That's the way I play. I don't play like I'm like, I'm going to kill you! That which does not, I should put that on my guitar, that which does not kill you makes you stronger. Um, I beat the heck out of my guitars. When I play in concert, I've been doing a lot of concerts. I used to do 80% clinics, 20% concerts. The last uh, three years, it's been the exact opposite. I did a whole tour of the United States, but we didn't come to San Diego, unfortunately. Uh, we played the Whiskey in LA, that's as close to San Diego as so we got, then we headed up north uh, to San Jose, right around San Francisco. But anyway, I love Dean guitars. When I perform in concert, I play stock Deans, except for one thing. I love EMG Active Pickup Systems, which is what is in this guitar. This is one of my signature guitars called the MAB-1 Speed of Light. There's a certain, uh, there's a few things that I looked for in a signature guitar. I actually didn't even want a signature guitar with Dean because I thought, because the ego involved with the signature, so many guitar players would put their initials on the 12th fret, they'd make it like, I, 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 me, 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 you know, narcissist, they should call it, yes, this is a Michelangelo Badio narcissistic guitar. And so I thought, you know, unless your name is Les, the only one that's gonna buy your guitar is maybe your uncle that plays. And so I thought that signature guitars would never go. And so what I did is I said, well, wait a second, let me think this, because Dean said, look it, you're a popular guy, we can sell a lot of your guitars. And I said, I don't want my name on this guitar. That's my first thing I said, I said, I don't want my name on the fretboard. Do you see these frets? There's nothing that says Michelangelo. I didn't even want it to be called MAB, which is what everyone refers to me online. Um, Dean said, look it, we've got to say something that it's yours. So they said, we want you to title it the MAB series. This is a great guitar. Um, Chris Caffery from Trans-Siberian Orchestra and Sabotage used one of my MAB ones called the Armor Flame uh, for the Trans-Siberian Tour, uh, Orchestra Tour a few years ago. And I, and I, I was talking to him at, at the music show in LA in, in January in Anaheim. And I said, Chris, we're, we're hanging out talking about football. You know, I mean, he's really into football. And I like it. I like sports. I mean, it's not my life, but I know a lot about it. I'm from Chicago. You know, the Cubs are doing pretty good. The Blackhawks didn't do too bad this year. And so there's always a great Chicago sports team. That's what we have. Uh, we don't have weather, but we have a lot of stuff. Chicago's a great place. A and uh, it's going to be the fourth largest city. Houston's going to overtake Chicago. That sucks with population, but I like Houston a lot, too. A and I was just there on tour. Uh, but anyway, Chris, I told Chris, I said, Chris, you know that's one of my signature guitars. He goes, he goes but it kicks, you know what? He goes, it's awesome. And so um, I made signature guitars that are good guitars. The last thing that I wanted is to promote Michelangelo Badio. First of all, that'd be a lot of letters on the 12th fret, but I didn't want my MAB double guitar. I didn't want it all little like, I, me, narcissist. Narcissist. I didn't want that. I wanted a great guitar. Now, here's what I know about guitars. You can pretty much any brand uh, of guitar nowadays is all right. Um, and and because we we have you know big Dean is one of the biggest guitar companies on the planet. It, it just is. And and where other guitar companies are big here in the United States, they're not even represented. Dean is in Kathmandu, Nepal. I toured in Kathmandu. I toured in Nepal a couple years ago before that really bad earthquake. And uh, when I played Dean Guitars, one of the distributors out there started promoting Dean because um, he, he took on Dean. Dean is everywhere. Not every guitar company can say that. Well, a few of Gibson and Fender can say that. But a lot of the other ones that you think are really big here are only big. Dean is big everywhere. And so, but what I did with my guitars, I said, okay, you're not gonna see my name here good components. When I perform in concert, this is a real s big thing with me. They have a beautiful custom shop in Florida. You can go to uh, Tampa, Florida, where the Dean headquarters is, take a tour of the factory. It's absolutely humongous. And you can see where they take a piece of wood and turn it into a guitar. 
Um, they built all of my double guitars. Uh, they, they're all USA. They make USA guitars. And when they don't make USA guitars, they do what every guitar company does. Uh, places like Korea, Japan, even China now can make a good guitar. Uh, what Dean does is we send the parts over to Korea. So it's really, you know, an EMG is American. Grover Tuning Keys are American. A Floyd Rose is American, although the top ones are made in Germany. Um, these are all super high quality parts, but you get it assembled somewhere else and it lowers the price dramatically. American put it together, then you're raising it, then the average price of a USA guitar is around $1,000 to 1200 and more. And whereas you put it together in just another country using all American parts, even sending over the wood, um, it's a lot less. And so, but the quality, because the owner is a bass player and he's phenomenal, he's not just a bass player, he's awesome on bass. Really, really is. Um, he's played on two of my records right now. Not all the songs, but a couple of them. Uh, he's fantastic. But with this signature guitar, it is called the Speed of Light. What I do on my own guitars, I love an act. This is an active high-end pickup system called EMG, the, the brand. I have a Dean signature pickup called the HWS. It's a passive pickup, so there's no battery. Um, I, I do other things uh, with, with a pickup. Um, I love EMGs, but on some of my guitars on tour, I swap the EMG system out for a passive pickup system, and it's all done in the United States at, at Dean headquarters in Tampa. So that when you see me perform in concert, I use the same exact guitars that you can buy here at Pitbull Audio. And the reason is, what good is Dean guitars if I have to get custom-made instruments for you can never play? I can, do I can get any good luthier in the United States to build me a guitar. I know a bunch of them. Um, and I can have them put Dean on it. That's not a Dean guitar. The guitars I use are Dean's. You're hearing me play tonight with absolutely zero effects. There's no ambient anything. It's in your face live. But I'm, from, I'm confident that these guitars get the tone that they do. You. Um, I knew that this guitar would wang out like it did. I knew that it would get the pinched harmonics. Um, each guitar is different, but Dean rules. All these guitars are my signature guitars. That is one of the newer ones. This one of the least expensive Dean guitars. It, when you look at it, it's amazing. And what I learned about guitars is this, that I'm a really good friends with Wayne Charvel, who is the man behind Charvel Guitars, and I'm really good friends with Grover Jackson. Wayne Charvel built my original Rocket guitar. He built two double guitars for me, and he built that iconic quad guitar um, that I played in the freight train video that you can you can go to YouTube. Um, he built it. I invented it, but I had one of the greatest guitar builders on planet Earth, Wayne Charvel. He lived in the Redlands. Uh, he he's lives up north now, but he built anything that I could imagine in my head. Wayne could build. So when you have a guy named Charvel that can build anything you want, and he's a close, he's like family to me. I could do anything, and I I have an engineering mind. Um, I do stuff. I have patents. Um, why is my double guitar on these angles? I figured all this stuff out. This didn't just happen. Uh, Steve I just didn't do his heart guitar because he thought of this entire thing. He had mine to look at, and I love Steve I. We're friends. Uh, we've done shows together. Um, but this guitar is available. It's from Pitbull Audio. All these guitars that you see here are from Pitbull. This is one of the medium to higher end price. Um, it's not a USA model. It's, come from it's all USA parts. And Dean was the very first company ever to put a non-company pickup in the guitar. Think about that. Um, Gibson guitars, Gibson pickups, Fender guitars, Fender pickups. Well, when Dean first started up, they were making these awesome high-end USA guitars. They have people like Sammy Hagar. Even Randy Rhodes owned a Dean. There's pictures. Now, I'm not saying that he endorsed them, but he loved them. And there's pictures of them with them. I can, I know the Rhodes family. They've heard my tribute to, to Randy a bunch of times, even this year uh, in January when I played the Randy Rhodes Remembered concert in uh, in Anaheim. So anyway, with an EMG active pickup system, this is not a Dean product. These top of the line USA Grover tuning heads are not a Dean product, but Dean was the first company that started that. Because before Dean, everybody used all their own stuff for the most part. 
What Dean said is, you know what? I'm making these great guitars, and I've got this guy named Larry that makes pickups. But no one wants Larry's pickups. They, he can't get arrested playing a, by uh, selling a pickup. But he had these awesome pickups. So Dean said, I'm not going to put Dean pickups on, in my guitars. I'm going to put Larry's pickups. Well, Larry has a last name. DeMarzio. And Dean was the first company ever to even just use something as simple as a DeMarzio pickup. This was unheard of. It was like, oh my God, it was so different. But DeMarzio made amazing pickups. We take this stuff for granted. Who, d who did it? Dean. That's why I love him. Um, now I'm going to switch guitars. And at, like I said, every single guitar that you see on this stage, it's from Pitbull Audio. And speaking of Pitbull Audio, what a great place to do a clinic. Can we get a round of applause for all the people here that put this on? Now, this is one of my signature guitars that came out this year. It's called an MAB3. Um, it's got a beautiful flame maple top. And this guitar is like high threes, low four. Um, I don't know how they can do it. And, and uh, it's just an amazing guitar. You're going to hear it. I'm going to play one of my songs called Rainforest. I love to write music. And I have, I have songs in video games. I have songs in movies. I've acted in music, uh, movies. Uh, if I had a list of things I wanted to accomplish in my career, I've been very, very fortunate. Uh, like I said earlier, I only said it once. I have toured 58 countries. I've been to China 11 times. I have traveled through the Alps. I've been on the longest bridge in the world over the ocean in Denmark. I've seen the Forbidden City in China. I've seen the Terracotta Soldiers. It's unbelievable. Um, everything, I've stood one foot in front of the center stone of Stonehenge. I've climbed pyramids in Mexico City, in Peru. I've been all over South America. I have a 10-year visa to Peru. I've been to India. I haven't seen the Taj Mahal. Once I see the Taj Mahal and the pyramids of Egypt, I'm pretty good. Then that's about it for me. Uh, I've been to every state in the United States performing, and I'm not saying this to be cool, but when I played in the jungle of Borneo in Indonesia, and this is the most populous Muslim country on the planet, but they're Asian Muslims. It's a lot different than what we hear in the Middle East. And, you know, always there's stereotypes. People think of Americans as something, but when you actually go to a country and you find out what they're really like, I had these girls in these burkas dressed in tight jeans going, and I got, all these, I got all these pictures of them, but I didn't post it because I played in Israel earlier this year. Like, I never post anything political. I don't want to be Ted Nugent. I don't want to be, uh, I don't. You know, I, I have my views, but, but I'm like a live and let live guy. And, and so, but if I posted a girl in a burqa doing this, I'd get hate mail like you couldn't believe. Um, when I just said that I was touring Israel earlier this year, which I did for the very first time, I got so much hate mail. The government of Israel emailed us and said, look it, you know, we have protection for you. It's, it's fine because I'd never been there. It's unbelievable. If I say my, my you know, my, my ex fiance lived in Cor Coronado Island. She had a, a therapy dog. Her dog got attacked three times by pit bulls. So if I say I'm not a big fan of pit bulls, I get flamed online like a thousand people. It's not the dog, it's the owner. Well, if you raise a tiger and it bites you. And so now I have my own views. And then, but then I find out my mutt dog is part pit bull. And so, and I like her. And so, and she's 13 now and she's really tough for her age. And so, but the moral of the story is this, I don't post any of this stuff live online because I don't want to get into arguments. I am a musician. I don't go to Russia. I've been to Russia four times. I've been to most, I've been to Mexico so many times, but I've never been to Puerto Rico, to Cabo Wabo, um, Acapulco. I go to the Cleveland, Ohio. So I go to, you know, Guadalajara, Mexico City. I've been in the south in the Chapas area. Um, I go where they play. But I've seen so much of this world, so much. I could spend a month telling you things that I have seen on this planet that would blow your mind. Um, but I can say this, all because of playing a guitar. Never ever take that for granted. And I never have ever have changed one note to play differently because somebody said, well, this is the flavor of the month or this is in style now. I was like, screw this. Because if you listen to rock music, if you're a young musician or any musician, the reason why we listen to Johann Sebastian Bach today, uh, my, my little uh, 
my first cousin son, which is my first cousin once removed, uh, is 13 years old. Uh, he plays in, in the orchestra in his school. He doesn't want to play guitar, but he plays, a, a, he plays trumpet. He loves it. And so, but my nephew, who's going to be 14, plays guitar. But he doesn't want to play like his Uncle Mike because he said he could never be faster than me. He goes, and so he plays more like the edge or somebody, he's a very exper experimental guitarist, but they, he uses Rocksmith, but all the young kids are into music. But it's something that is pretty amazing to me because anywhere on this planet, people listen to our tonal. Something like this. <laughs> That's not China's tonal system. That's not India's tonal system. They have notes between our notes. American or, or people, person from the West would listen and go, ah, ah, it's like, like fingers against a blackboard. It sounds so funky to our ear. I've listened to Chinese opera. I can barely handle it because the notes are in between our notes. I'm like, like, ah. And so, but we don't adopt their system. They adopted ours. And what that means is that our music everywhere, everywhere around the planet. So when I said going into the jungles of Borneo, guitars was there, all 58 countries. Now, I'm gonna shut up and play. This is my song called Rainforest, and I wrote this, I have a 10-year visa to Brazil. I'm actually flying to Brazil Saturday and doing six shows out there, then going to Peru. I love Brazil, it's one of the awesome, awesome places on the planet. Um, and I'm gonna just say this as a dude, I mean, I think obviously the, you know, I'm a I think the hottest women are in men. But man, you go to Brazil, it's like, oh my God. <laughs> wow! It's like my neck hurts. I'm like, she's hot. She's hot. She's hot. They're all hot. And so, but I love going to Brazil and I can't wait. I fly into Sao Paulo. I've actually only played Rio once. We usually fly into Sao, S A O, not Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo. And, and uh, that's where I'm flying in. And we're doing six shows, six days. And I absolutely love it. Anyway, here is my song called Rainforest. The main riff is in 11-4. So if you want to bang your head, you have to bang it with a mathematical purpose. 10, 11! So anyway, I like to write in mixed meters. Here we go. My song called Rainforest on the MAB3. And I can't say this enough. These guitars are stock. I've never played this guitar in my life. I never played this guitar in my life. I've never used this strap in my life, this cable, or these amps. Sure, I'm not going to use that delay again. And so, <laughs> but I know this, that, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. You just do what Frank Zappa said, shut up and play guitar.
Thank you, thank you. I have one more song to play, then I'm gonna bring out the double guitar. Um, I wanted to do things that were different. I came up with this idea. I am left-handed, and so, and I play piano, and I studied music, and if you can get uh, anything out of uh, this workshop tonight, uh, I have a few things that I live by. You know, there's a Nike commercial that everybody knows, just do it. Well, I have a different take on it. I don't believe doing it is the, just the answer. I have a different way to, to, this is my, the Mikey version of just do it, just finish it. And this is why I say, um, I have a degree in music. I have a university degree. It doesn't make me smarter than any person in this room. You know what? I finished. When I write songs, I finish songs. When I record a record, I release it. When I practice with a band, I play on stage. And I found that as a little guy, I didn't understand this, but I always wanted to play live. I would write songs, I'd finish them, I'd record them. Um, I'd do everything that I could. And I dropped out of school in college. I was in a really popular cover band. I was 19 years old. You know, we had, a, you know, we were young, we were cool looking. You know, we, we had it all going on. And then I stopped and I, I stopped the band. I quit the band and I said, you know what? I'm going to school to finish. And it's, and I've never had a backup plan. I've never said, I'm not going, if I don't make it a music, I'm going to do this. Now, this is only the world according to Mikey, but I, I know this. My family is from Northern California. And my grandmother was like this hippie grandmother. She was down to here. She lived in San Francisco. So when I was 10 years old and I started playing guitar at 10, we went to San Francisco to visit my grandmother. And, and she uh, actually comes from the South, she's from DC. And, and uh, she moved up to San Francisco. She was just into it. And I remember, uh, you know, I, I started, I didn't have long hair then, I had real short hair. And, and, and I went there and I saw. So first of all, we went there when it was cold in Chicago, and it was not obviously not you know Southern California weather, but it was warm, and I'm like, this sucks. Chicago sucks. We have winter. I said San Francisco isn't like that, and I saw all this you know these beautiful you know the crookedest street in the world, uh, you know the Fisherman's Wharf, the you know as a kid, and and I saw these people walking around with their hair looking like hippies and and musicians, and I'm like, man, this is just so cool. And, and I remember um, I said to myself then, I said, you know, a lot of my family's from Santa Cruz. Um, I happened to be born in Chicago. I couldn't help where I was born. But I said, I'm moving to California. As soon as I'm out of school, I am moving. And, and what I used to do is I used to go visit my grandmother, and, and I got to know San Francisco pretty well. And when I got out of school, the first thing that I did was orchestrate my move to Los Angeles. And at the time, when you think about Chicago, Chicago's called Second City. It's not New York. It's not Los Angeles. But we do have Oprah Winfrey. Um, all the, the daytime TV talk shows were based in Chicago. And what this also meant, a lot of people don't know this, but Chicago was the radio jingle capital of the United States. So if you watched a TV program and you heard you know, bacon sizzling in a pan on a TV commercial, the chances are the music was done in Chicago, not California, not New York. And guess what? Moi became one of a, a top session guitar player. And I did it by accident. I, wa I was going to college, and, and there was a course offered that if you could get outside approval, whether to be a recording engineer or different things, like to be a booking agent, because uh, uh, Chicago has Jam Productions. In fact, the, uh, the PA company that, that is well, was with Van Halen's tour is, again, from Chicago. Chicago's got a lot of happening stuff. It's not LA, it's not New York, but it's really an amazing city. It's got so much going on. So anyway, I walk into this recording studio wanting to be an engineer, and I see this guitar in the corner, and I pick it up, and I start riffing out. And the owner of the studio is like, his name is Todd McGuire. And he goes, and Todd goes, hey, man. He goes, can you read music? I go, yeah, that's what I'm going to college for. And I, I had set up this meeting with him. So, and so um, what I did was I got him to sign off on a class. So it was a three-hour. You needed 12 credit hours uh, per semester. That was full time. This was one of the classes, three hours. And I was going to learn to be a recording engineer. I learned nothing. It turned out this guy was this aspiring writer. He wrote the worst pop songs ever. I'll never forget this song, part of the picture. You're only part of the picture. I'm like, that sucks. Doesn't sound like Judas Priest. And so, but I heard these cheesy songs, but all of a sudden, 
Taco Bell. He did pretty good on that. And, and all of a sudden, he's doing United Airlines, United Way, Burger King, Pizza Hut, Kentucky Fried Chicken. And instead of me, I got an A in the class. Instead of me learning how to be a recording engineer, I became his number one session guitar player. Because in when you read session music, uh, a lot of people don't know this. Even in Johann Sebastian Bach's time, they just would write a bass. They would write a figured bass, and you'd see numbers underneath like six, four, three, four, two, six, five. These are all inversions. It tells you that the bass note might not be the root. It might be a flatted seventh. It might be a third. It might be a fifth. There's all these numerical things. And, and what great musicians could do in box day is they would watch the bass and have all these numbers underneath and be able to improvise over it. Well, it's the same thing with session music. You might see a C chord. They don't want you to strum it like you're in the Eagles. They want you to do something cool. And so I was able to do stuff that was cool. And, and I became a, a, a top call session guitarist. Why am I saying this? I've had a lot of experience in music. And when I do workshops, I get to talk about it a little bit. But I'm very grateful for what I do. I only use Dean guitars. I used them before I was famous. My first double guitar, uh, the very first double guitar is not in the Rock Hall of Fame. It's actually in the Tampa Hard Rock Casino. This Tampa Hard Rock is amazing. It's right above the main doorway to the pool. To the left is Kid Rock. Uh, there's Rush. And to the right is this whole Dean display of guitars. They put it in Tampa because the Dean Guitars headquarters. One of my double guitars called the Mach 7 Jet Double is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That was one that was built around 2006. It's I, I gave him the case. I gave him everything. We did the ceremony. It was really cool. Um, but getting back to, to music, I have an extensive history of playing. And when I was in the band Nitro, I can play the instruments. That's the thing. I could do it. I, w I fit, in, they wanted me to play fast and I could, but my history is not like that. My history was growing up in the Chicago area, almost like a cheap trick band. Um, when you hear my first band, Holland, I wrote every song with that band. We were good enough to get signed to Atlantic Records. I'm a good songwriter. And, and it's something that people don't know, and it's easy to say when someone plays fast, oh, they have no taste, they have no feeling. That's all stupid stuff. Let people talk. They said that about Franz Liszt 150 years ago. It's just sheep talking because they don't know anything um they don't know about the discography they know nothing and so and i don't worry about those people like i said you got to worry about someone like me because i ain't going to talk i'm not going to post anything bad about anybody i'm going to sit in the studio and work on a record i'm going to work on a new dvd or I'm gonna work on a new double guitar solo or i'm going to invent something different those are the people you got to worry about um and i can say this when i said just finish it is madonna the hottest looking babe on the planet is Taylor Swift the best singer in the world? No. Um, is Kanye West the best anything? No. And so, okay, but these people are famous. You know why? They believed in themselves. See, it's not arrogant or narcissistic to say you believe in yourself. Here's what happened to me as a kid. I was a little guy. Now, I, I'm Italian, the other side is German, but my dad was kind of feisty, and he was, he was a tough guy. And he grew up in a really tough neighborhood in Chicago, and he fought all the time. And so when I was a kid, I used to take judo and boxing. And I, I have this, I'm a really nice person, but I have this line that I draw that once the line's drawn, I'm, I don't have to be nice. And I'm not a, a wimp. And so I used to get in fights as a kid. And what happened one time is I had this guy, my last name is Badio. He kept calling me Babio. I'm like, yeah! I couldn't stand it. We got in this big fight. I'm and I wound up, I had him on the curb, and I'm like this. And I punched a curb straight on, straight on cement. It broke this metacarpal bone. My, my knuckle was in my wrist. And I had a cast on because I was a little guy. I was only 13. It's the last fight I ever got into. And I said, you know, fighting sucks. I'm going to play guitar. And so, but even with a cast of three weeks, I'd been playing guitar for three years already. I was dreaming of guitar riffs. And I said to myself this. I said, I'm never going to do that. I changed my idea about about who I am as a person. But I realized this, about finishing things, when, even as a kid with the cast, I was working on, like, I had, this, like, it was a brace on my finger. I still have the cast. Uh, it was a brace on this finger to hold the bone to, to heal correctly. Now, I broke my hand so bad. This bone was here. It dislocated. I have never been hurt. Once it's it set, 
I realize I've never had a fight since. It doesn't mean, uh, you know, that my attitude sometimes, but I have never had a fight. And, and, but I can say this, I've never been hurt playing. And I'm not young anymore. I've never, I tour all over this planet. I get no sleep a lot of times. I had to drive from LA to San Diego. I went to the hotel, took a shower, came over here. I'm playing guitars I've never played before. I've got the Mojave Desert guitar sound here. It's drier than I can possibly imagine. I make no excuses, but this is why I come from experience. I'm an NFL football player. Um, that's, you know, when I was uh, growing up in Chicago, the the, art, the guitar, the uh, running back, Walter Payton, he'd never been hurt in his career. We had Michael Jordan in Chicago. I use those people as influences. Um, when I practice, do you notice I haven't sat down the whole clinic? When I rehearse, and I told my nephew this too, he's in a band, I watched him sitting down at rehearsal. I go, I go Alex. What are you doing sitting down? I said, are you going to play like that? When you rehearse, you rehearse hard. You rehearse hard, as hard as it is playing. When I'm with the owner of Dean Guitars and we rehearse for shows, I'm moving around. When we do the double guitar solo, I'm playing it. Michael Jordan taught me that. So did Walter Payton. They, they practiced as hard as they played. And, and see, because this is the game. Anybody can talk and be criticized. Anybody online can do this. And that's why I said I, I hope you know, that I want to be a positive influence on the guitar community. But I can tell you this, just out of this workshop, if you just whatever career you're in, finish stuff. If you're writing a song, finish it. If you go to school, finish it. it having a college degree does not mean you're a good musician. Ingve knows a tenth of, of, about music of what I know, but he is a fantastic guitar player. So education doesn't make you a great musician. But I'll tell you what education did for me. It gave me the ability to learn. And so, like, if I hear something like, like for example, that Eminem song, Rock God, um, you know, I'm a rock god, rock god. Dude, he's a I mean, you hear this, and then he starts rapping a million miles an hour. And it's like, and then and there's another rapper called Twista that's like, raps like a thousand, you know, it's so fast. And when I listen to things that I don't quite grasp at first, like I remember it's the same thing when I heard Killer Queen by C Queen. These chords are like, it just analyze Bohemian Rhapsody. I mean, it's brilliant. And so, but I hear these chords, I'm like, what the heck is this? I couldn't even tell if I liked it or not. I put on my music theory ears, whether it's super fast. See, though, I, I'm not the biggest uh, rap fan in the world, but I like it, especially people like Eminem and people who rap like him, because the rhythms are so intense. Like, it, it's so many different rhythms in one song. So I'm listening to the rhythm. I, I analyze it. I analyze the rhythmic composition of it. And that's what really helps me in music. I listen to a lot of new music. And I can say this, the youngest generation of guitar players and musicians is absolutely incredible. Absol when you hear a band just like Five Finger Death Punch, they rip on guitar solos. He's a great player. He's a great rhythm player. Then you have people like the Winery Dogs. Uh, their album debuted in the top 30. They just... Richie Kotzen, Billy Sheehan, great musicianship is all over the place, and especially in this younger generation, and, and it's really good to know that. Um, now, I'm going to play a song for you that um, illustrates what I've been trying to say. You don't reinvent the wheel. You learn from what happened in the past. When you look at 1970, don't look at it through 2015 eyes. Try and put yourself, what was it like then? Because hindsight is always 20. But when you had people like Jimmy Page and Jimi Hendrix, they were the cutting edge, they were in their early 20s, they were killing it. But we look back and we can analyze it in our perspective. Well, we've had almost 50 years to look back and say, well, I could have done this and I could have that. Well, it's easy. It's easy to have hindsight. You know, oh, this guy could have caught the ball at this thing. But you weren't there. And you didn't think in those times. Those times are unique to themselves. And that's the thing. My dad always said this, do not reinvent the wheel. So I listened to Beethoven and Bach the same way I listened to Richie Blackmore and Jimmy Page. They are historical, fantastic music performers and writers. Here is my version of my favorite classic metal band besides Metallica that they were after. This is my tribute to Led Zeppelin. Played on the MAB3. This is uh, the least expensive guitar on the line. I wish I could play more for you, but I tuned down a half step. And most of these guitars are not. My uh, album Intermezzo and, and my newest album uh, are use I use almost entire, entirely seven strings. 
of seven strings. Um, we've just got guitars all over the place. That has 29 frets, but I only have two that are tuned up. This down a half step, or I would have played. Shred position. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm pretty animated. Uh, I love to talk. I didn't know I could even speak in public because uh, I'd always been in bands with lead singers. And then uh, and I remember, uh, you know, I'd be in bands with a singer that would be like, Hello, Cleveland, how you doing? It reminded me of the guy in the first Spider-Man movie. You got in the cage for five minutes of pain. You know, that, that wrestler. And, you know, I thought, you know, what was that? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and uh, you know, and then I had another singer uh, that I work with that was so natural. And, and I mean, he just would talk to the audience. And I remember like watching, there's this artist named Jewel, if anybody's familiar with her. And I remember watching her in concert and she's like, well, you know, I used to live in Alaska and I was homeless, I live in my car. And she said all this crazy stuff, but it was all true. And the way she was so natural with the audience, um, I didn't know I could even talk to anybody until I, I started doing workshops and I love to do them and I don't get to do many anymore. It's a, it's a shame. So um, I, I don't know in two years if I'll, I'll do any workshops anymore. But I, I just want to say this uh, again before I play the double. Can we get a round of applause for all the great people here at Pitbull Audio to put this clinic on? <laughs> yes! Thank you. And, and I can't stress enough, I think Dean Guitars rule. Absolutely rule. They have some of the biggest artists on the planet. Um, Dime and, and I, uh, I, was, I was pretty good friends with him, and I know his brother Vinny pretty well in Hell Yeah. Hell Yeah is a really cool band. And uh, what I do know is this. Like I said, from the top down, Elliot, the owner of Dean Guitars, is an amazing bass player. Um, there's a classic rock band called The Who, and their original bass player, John Entwistle, is not around anymore. But his estate, and he was known as a really great bass player in his day, the estate of John Entwistle was looking for a guitar company to do a commemorative bass, and they chose Dean Guitars. Why? The owner's a bass player and understood exactly the nuances. Uh, Dean Guitars has great jazz bass players. Uh, they've got some iconic endorsees like Dave Mustaine, even Brett Michaels, uh, when he plays guitars, uses Dean, and he sells a lot of them to women! And uh, so, but they also have people like Toby Keith, um, I don't know if anybody knows this, but Toby Keith is right up there with the top concert draws anywhere. The guy grosses more per year than almost anybody, and he refuses even to go to the Country Music Awards. He's this rebel. He's like, and he goes, I don't want this stuff. And, and uh, he's a really cool dude, uh, but he, they play Dean guitars. Um, there's all types of different bands, uh, newer bands uh, that play Dean guitars, established people. Michael Schenker played Gibson's forever. Um, he's played Dean for over 10 years. He switched to one guitar company. Nobody could make him switch instead of Dean. I can't say enough. I mean, you're hearing me play guitars I've never, ever played before. Um, I wanted to do something different. It gets me shows all over the planet. Um, I invented this double guitar. Not to be better, I invented this move too. I have been showing this move since I was a young guy in the 80s, and it took till the 21st century because all these, quote, pundits, you know, people who know it all, and, you know, the, they could say what they, they say, what are you doing this for, man? And then me with Mr. Degree knows what happened in the past. That's what I was saying. Just, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you want to learn guitar, listen up. My little 13-year-old nephew loves ACDC, he loves Led Zeppelin, and he loves Event Sevenfold. And so he likes new music, but he under, he, he's just a kid. He doesn't know, but he likes what's good is always going to be good. I still like Motley Crue songs. She's got the looks that kill. I still like it. It's a killer tune. You know, too young to fall in love. Too young. You know, I listen to these songs. They're awesome. And so a great song is a great song. I'm a big fan of, of early Linkin Park. And people say, what? But when I heard that song, in the end, it doesn't even matter. When I heard that song, it's like, that's such an intense tune. It's such a great song. A great song is a great song. I don't care. Who wrote it? You know, it could be, I want it that way. Tell me why. Backstreet Boys, what? And so, but I don't care who writes the song. Because I could do a metal version of any song. In fact, I heard it. I'm going to play my double. I listen to everything. My iPod is huge. I got one of those. Uh, I bought it new uh, only about a year ago. But it's the older one with 180 gig drive. I've got thousands and thousands of songs. And I'm not telling you guys what to do, but I bought every single record unless I had a record. I buy so much stuff on iTunes. Love listening to all kinds of music, all different stuff. And so, but here's what happened. 
I was doing a guitar clinic for Dean Guitars. I was in so I was in Utah driving through the salt flats. Now, if anybody's not seen this, it looks like an alien landscape. I'm not kidding. There are parts of that you don't think you're on planet Earth. You're just it's the sand, sandy like picture like the wind just pummeling sand mountains. You know, for mil, you know, million, you know, a billion years. I mean, it just looks so far gone. And I'm driving, and then there were these fires going on, so I could see in front of me. I'm heading into this fire zone, and I'm listening to liquid metal. <sighs> And I'm hearing, and I know Jose, the, one of the DJs, really well. He's a big Dime fan. He played my stuff on, on Dime's birthday. Anyway, so I'm listening, and this band comes on, and everybody knows this riff. Well, a death metal band took a little different version of that one. Got a good reason. For taking the easy way out. She was a day tripper. And by the time I'm like, go, 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 go. I'm listening. It was one chord. There was no Moses. She's so heavy. And I'm listening to it going, I'm doing like 120 now. I'm like, yeah, go, 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 go. I'm listening to this going, this is outrageous because I've always heard. So everybody held their guitar high. Hello. Tell me why. And so, you know, I'm hearing. And I'm driving. And I'm like, yeah, it's happening again. Gah. Got a good reason. And when I heard, all it was was rhythm. There was no melody. But it's like, instead of going, dun, do, 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 they just went, go, 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 go. And it was a low B. So it's like lower than God itself. And so you heard this thing. But it was awesome. At the end of the song, and then they did that song, She's So Heavy, uh, from the Beatles off Abbey Road. It was like one chord. One chord throughout the whole thing. There was no melody whatsoever. But I loved it. At the end, I'm like, this is bad. Dude's bad. And so anyway, why did I say that? It has nothing to do with the workshop today. But what I can't say is this. I love listening to all types of music. And I wanted to do things on guitar that were different. So when these pundits said, well, why are you doing this, man? That's stupid. Well, I said to myself, I said to them, well, why did Jimi Hendrix smash guitars? Does anyone ever hear classic Hendrix and hear the Zippo lighter torch the guitar and smash it? Does anybody hear that in the song? Does anybody hear Jimmy Page playing his guitar down to his ankles? I hear the lowness of the guitar, dude. He was only down to his ankles, bro. I heard it, bro. I heard it. How do you hear this stuff? How do you hear Slipknot in a mask? How does Buckethead wear the KFC bucket and the William Shatner death mask? Um, do you hear this in the music? I heard it, dude. I could hear it in his face, dude. Well, how do you exactly do you do that? And I, I met Buckethead, and he wouldn't take off the mask and the, and the hat. And I, I, I got actually kind of aggravated. I'm like, I was going to say something smart to him. Like, like, dude, tell me about the bucket, bro. Is it original or extra crispy? You can tell me. I ain't going to tell nobody. And so, you know, I could have done that. You know, I, I, I do a lot of public speaking. I'm pretty quick on my feet. But you don't. I don't need this in the studio. You know what? I show Gene Simmons how to do this. I jammed with Kiss before. When they took off their makeup, the mic was there. And, and I had jammed with them uh, at SIR Studios, at Sunset and Gower. It was Paul Stanley here, uh, here, Gene Simmons here, Eric Carr, the drummer. Here, Chris, it was already a newer band. And I, I, we were jamming, and I was singing Dr. Love. And he was cracking up. And Jesus, says, what are you singing? Because I never, I don't have one Kiss song on my iPod. Not that I don't like them or respect them. I don't listen to them. And I like them, but I don't, I don't listen to them. I don't have Leonard Skinner. I don't have the Stones. It doesn't mean I don't like them. I just, I don't listen to it. I listen to other stuff. And so but, uh, what I did was I just copied the lyrics off the record. I didn't get a songbook. And, and I, they were all wrong. And Simmons was cracking up. He's like, I can't believe you're singing this. And so, and then we were playing and, this is the thing that I love, and this is why I said about reinventing a wheel, and don't learn from the past, because Gene broke into this. It's an Eric Clapton cream song. Now, there's a difference. The actual cream song was in D. But 
when he started playing it in E, I knew it. And then all of a sudden, this is the first time I'd ever heard big time. You should have heard this. They had me playing through two Marshall stacks, and they're playing it. And you hear, I'm with you, my love. And, and Gene starts singing this, and it's like the demon is here. I love it! And he's singing this thing, and it's so intense. And it's like, it's like I've been waiting so long. And then Paul Stanley comes in with the harmonies, and it is like God. I was like, whoa! You should, I mean, it sounded so intense. And then I start doing my solo. Uh, when it comes to the solo, I didn't just play like... I started going nuts. I started going ballistic. See what happens when I start talking about Kiss? Thank God I never drop it when I play. But all of a sudden, I'm starting to do this during the solo, and Gene goes, stop. Michael, how do you do that? And I start going, Whoa! and I start doing that. And he's like, looking at you, it's like, interesting. And then I was thinking to myself, see, he used to be a lot meaner sounding in person. Like, I think being on that show, The Family Jewels, when I first met Gene Simmons, he had this look about him like, I've gone out with Cher. What are you going to do to impress me? You know, it's like the guy had been there and done that and done everything. There's nothing you could say or do to the guy. And I remember when I started showing him this, he made me stop and start and play about three times. And after the third time, I'm like, screw this. I was, I'm like, I don't care if you're the god of thunder. I'm thinking this. I, go, I ain't going to stop and start just for you anymore. I was getting pissed. And so then he wanted, he goes, Michael, play. Because the band had stopped. They were freaking out. They'd never seen anything like this before. And then Gene says, Michael. I'm like, and I'm thinking to myself, are you saying I can't play? You. You know, I don't got the boots. You don't got the boots on now, baby. And so, you know, this is what I'm thinking. And, and so all of a sudden he goes, Michael. I'm like, what? He goes, how do you do that? I'm like, ah, oh, okay, Gene. And now here's me. I'm showing Gene how to, how to play over and over the neck. And then he says to me in this voice, he doesn't really sound like this anymore when he talks. He's mellower now, but he's like, interesting. I'm like, yeah. And I started thinking to myself, this dude's got an eight foot long tongue. I don't know if you've ever seen the, you know, and I'm like, I wanted to stay a healthy distance. I felt like he was the frog and I was a fly, you know. And so I don't know if you've ever, you know, the Star Wars scene, it's this little scene where this frog, it's just going, it zaps this bug. That's, I felt like the bug standing next to Gene Simmons. But I showed him how to play over the neck. And you watch. Watch some of the videos of Kiss without their makeup. The very first time. So I showed him. And uh, I've known him for a long, long time. And the reason I'm saying this is because I patterned the double guitar and I patterned this after people like Kiss. It's not something new. Elvis Presley had a look. He dyed his hair jet black. Um, there are people... Um, Mozart could put a cloth over a keyboard and play. Um, when you can come up with great music, I've been signed to Warner Brothers twice. Listen to my solo records. They were my Dean guitar, my guitar strap, my cable, my amps. I get, I'm a major label quality artist. So when you hear my solo records, especially the one called Intermezzo, uh, it was released at the end of 2013. I have a newer one out, but it's more of like a, like a discography. It's it's parts of my 12 records. Uh, that's uh, 11 records. That's the 12th, and it, and it debuted at number 11 on the Hard Rock Billboard charts. But when I record, I do the best that I can, just like I play live. But I don't have to do this over under thing, but. Slipknot doesn't wear masks in the studio. I doubt if Gene Simmons ever wore his paint when he's recording in the studio. But live, if, if you, if A, it starts with the music. If you have great music, and you portray something, like whether it's Metallica just wearing jeans and a t-shirt, whether it's Motley Crue holding it low and having their look, or whether it's someone like a Taylor Swift who's got a million people on stage with her or a Britney Spears, if you can do something you know, I mean, look at all these pop singers, whether, whether any, anybody you look at, um, they've always, they're up there singing, they've got a million dancers, whether it's Beyonce or Madonna or Taylor Swift, they've always got people around them because it just adds to the show because they could do it by themselves. I mean, listen to Taylor Swift's latest record, that 1989, I have it. I listen to it. It's a great pop record. Um, there's hardly any guitar in it, but she's... You know, there's a lot of uh, pitch correction on there, but it, it sold millions and millions of records, and I wanted to find out why. You know, 
know, because that's what I look at. I don't really criticize artists that made it. I ask myself, why am I watching them? You know, I mean, I have over 15 million views on one of my songs, you know, and people can comment, but one of the comments, or one of the things you should think of is, how did I get that many? What did I do to generate that kind of interest? And that's what I look at too. So I'll look at anybody. Um, my double guitar is the same way. I have the number one video in Guitar World magazine. And I really don't even like that video at all. It's recorded live. A lot of, most of my stuff is, but I hate it. Um, guitar World is a magazine. I think the audio's bad. I didn't mix it. I played it one take. That was it. I thought I played it great. But the sound of my amps doesn't even sound like that. And, but I had no control over it. It's a magazine. And I asked them if I could remix it, and they refused. They're like, well, if we did it for you, we'd have to do it for everybody. But I, it sounded so bad to me, and it's their number one video, so go figure. You know, and I'm grateful for that. So anyway, um, when I play the double guitar, the neck angles alone. I got the idea from Eddie Van Halen. My first designs of the double guitar were two necks straight out of biblical and I said well that's not gonna work and then I saw an, a Van Halen concert it was their second concert and then uh, and then after this I'll just shut up and play but I saw something with David Lee Roth that I'd never seen this is when Roth had the super long hair and he was really buffed I saw something that absolutely blew my mind it was the second album the second tour Eddie was magnificent he's got this guitar and a stand he's crazy tapping and when you heard it it was so dead on it was so on point that it was scary and and then Roth was standing on a drum riser okay I'm six one it it was had it was taller than any of the guys in Van Halen Eddie is not as tall as me but I met him before I know his son his son Wolf's pretty tall I know him both and anyway so this drum riser had to be almost as high as the ceiling higher than every guy in Van Halen at least by this much Roth is standing on the drum riser he jumped up in the air, did a scissor kick like this, like this, and he jumps down and lands perfect, like an Olympic like landing, like a gymnast landing. He's like, Psh! and he stopped like this. He stopped frozen. And there were video screens too. They, you know, wasn't as complex as they have today, but they had video so you could see them up close. Roth was like this. And the whole audience went quiet, and everybody started screaming, and he didn't move. Like this. All he did was this, he just turned his head. That was power. I've never seen power on stage. He controlled every single person in the audience and he didn't have to say a word. It was so mind blowing because he looked so bad. I mean, the guy was just, he just looked super cool. When, and, and, he, and he just, he didn't have to say anything. He was so confident and he was so athletic back then. It was incredible. And then Eddie's ripping out. And when I saw that show, it was just mind blowing. To me, I, I couldn't, it wasn't, that I understood everything they did because I was young and I was watching, uh, but I was blown away by what they could do, how they made the crowd feel. And when I saw Eddie play like this, I mean, I'm a good artist, and so I can, I'm a really good drawer. It's, I think talent comes in bunches. Uh, I don't have the kind of singing voice that I would like, but I can play piano really good, I can draw really good. So what I did was I took a, a picture of Van Halen in a magazine where he's playing like this and smiling, and I took tracing paper and I traced his image. It was a full body shot. I flipped it over, I saw my double. Then I took this thing called a protractor, which we don't see many of. It measures angles. It looks like this, it's like a half moon. And all it does is it measures an angle. Here's 90 degrees. It's about 110, 115. When I measured the angles of both guitars, it came out to about 115 degrees. So when I took my idea to Dean Guitars, who happened to originally start in the Chicago area, I told him I wanted two necks, left righty and lefty, approximately 115 degrees. Why? Because that's where a human plays. You split it in half and you put the other, this is where you play. Here's 90 degrees. And so what happens, so 90 degrees when you do this is too high. It looks like that. And so it's a little more than 90. And so I figured it out. So it's stupid things like this. I got the idea for the strap from a saxophonist. So it's a guitar strap, but it's got a neck. Why? Because then I can play lefty. I love Steve Vai to death. I'm going to see him on the Monsters of Rock Cruise. We're friends. When he did his heart guitar, he did the neck angles exactly like mine. You can add 20 necks, but just the idea of having it like this was my idea. And 
when he put the strap on, he put the strap like this. And what happens is your guitar goes like this. It makes it extremely difficult to play left-handed because you're fighting. It's, it, you want, it's this. So it stays in the center when I play. The last thing, I have a patent on these. String dampener. A lot of people nowadays take hair ties. They do all these things to dampen the strings. She, it's not cheating. I mean, Guthrie Govan, Greg Howe, all these fantastic guitar players, they put it here because on an electric guitar, you get a lot of extra string noise from amps. So what you need is something to mute the strings. And that's what I invented, but mine is better than hair ties, and it's better than all these. There's a keyboard player in a band called Mortal Guardian. He plays guitar and keyboards at the same time, and he only uses my dampeners. The thing that makes them so cool, and we're going to be selling they're going to be out all over the planet in another month. Uh, I licensed it to a big company, and they're coming out in stores everywhere for like $19.95. What you do is when you put the dampener down, it's like, <laughs> sorry, that's my overdrive. See, what it does is this. Plugged it, I'm sorry. Um, what it does, yeah, I'm thinking of the double. What I did, what it does is it blocks the strings, and all I have to do is flip it up, and it opens it up, and it blocks it so well all the way up to neck, so you don't have to use a hair tie and move it up and down the neck like a lot of people do. And you don't have to drill in your guitar. So it's ringing, locks it, and then I moves up and down. This is what enabled me to play the guitar. I wanted to do something real that I could really play and be good um, and be so mind blowing and have something that no one on the planet had. Uh, it gets me shows everywhere. So, anyway, who built the first one? Dean Guitars. Who built the latest one for me? Dean Guitars. No more talk. Here is the double. I must prepare. I must assume the double shred position. Fifteen pounds of death. People ask me, what is it like playing a guitar like this? Well, get a bowling ball, put a strap on it, and wear it around your neck for 15 minutes a day for about 150 days a year. Uh, but I love playing the guitar. And so I'm going to play. Is, what I did was there's two things that I tried to do. I read something when I was a kid that said Jimi Hendrix played guitar in more positions than anyone had ever played. I didn't really know what that meant, but it always stuck with me when, when I, as I got older. Like I didn't, I've never really known what that meant. You know, behind his back, you know, what, what could he do? But when I got the double guitar, that's what I asked myself, what's possible? So I said, okay, I can play quick. I can play left-handed. I can play right-handed. I can play two guitars at the same time this way. How about this way? How about flipping it upside down? So I figured out all these different ways, like a checklist. Then I wrote music that features my music and classic artists. So when somebody, and I do this purposely for anybody who says, oh, there's no music. I, I have the Allman Brothers in this. They were the first double lead band that got really popular, so I pay tribute to them. I've got Hendrix, I've got Zeppelin, I've got Randy Rhodes, I've got surf music all weaved into my music. So when somebody said, well, I don't hear the music in it, because they don't listen. They don't want to hear it. And so, and so when you really listen and you see all these things that are going on, you go, well, that makes sense. But there's something else that I do too. No one comments about this online. How do I go from here to here or to here smoothly? Uh, no one comments. This. No one says, dude, did you see how smooth he goes from this to this? Well, that was my main concern. You know, because there's a, a, a word, disjunct. I don't want it disjunct, and, and I want it smooth. So anyway, I get to say this in clinics. I, have, I just have to play. So anyway, you're going to see all these different things, and, and this is my thinking when I went into it. But the neck angles, the neck strap, the string dampeners, all this stuff is what I thought of. The case, 
I even came up with the idea of the case. I have an engineering mind. Um, I like to be creative in more ways than just playing a guitar. I like to invent stuff. A and it's, you know, no one had this before ever. It's easy for Steve I, and I love Steve I to death. I think he's great in every album he's ever put out. Um, but he had mine to look at. Um, when, when Tenacious D did the pick of Destiny, that's what got my guitar in the Rock Hall of Fame. They actually called up my agent. They said, we got Steve Vai using this. You've got people all over the world. Or it's in video games. Jack Black just used your guitar in a movie and gave you all these kudos for it. We'd like to get one of your guitars in the Hall, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Museum. That's how it happened. When you've got Steve Vai, Jack Black, I've been in a Kia commercial for this. I said to myself, uh, you know, I'll give you the keys to the Lamborghini. Now it's, I'll give you the keys to the Kia. I don't know. It doesn't quite. But uh, I've done all sorts of stuff. In Europe, there was a commercial recently where they actually bought one of my prototype doubles. This gorgeous, gorgeous hot babe. It's, it's, it's in a vodka commercial, and she like hands has these two bottles of vodka, and I don't know how they work this, and it morphs into where she starts playing a double guitar. And uh, so go figure. But anyway, I'm not going to say anymore. I could talk all night about it. Here's the double.
Thank you. Thanks. I think this is probably the driest I've ever played on this, but uh, you, know, you get to hear it. I mean, there's, there's zero effects. I use an overdriver and that's it. Um, the string dampeners really help. Gary, could you come up here too? And again, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for coming out tonight. Uh, I'm gonna chill out for a couple minutes. Just remember, every single guitar on this stage is for sale. It's uh, Pitbull Audio did a fantastic job. The amps are for sale, the cables, the straps, everything here on this stage, even if you want to double, we actually can build these uh, with Dean guitars exactly like this, color of your choice. So you can even order them. Last thing I'm going to show you is the engineering mind of Mikey for the final thing. This guitar was never, ever meant to be one guitar. I used a $10 American high case latch. It's always been two guitars. So my initial designs were two. And the case fits like this. So you see it, and you know, a lot of times in airports, people are like, they know me. If they don't know me, they've Googled me before I go through security. And I've got that TSA pre thing, so I can really fly through security now. Um, but the guitar case, looks like a keyboard case because that was my idea too to make the guitars like this. Um, we use a $10 flight case latch. Put it together, lock and load. And so it's been my design since day one. All this stuff went through my head when I was working on this guitar. Once it's done, it's easy to redo. Um, anybody can see it now and do it. Jack Black could do it with a pick of Destiny because he had my guitar to look at. But I wanna say this because you guys, a lot of you here are younger, you are the next generation. It doesn't matter what you do. Um, you don't have to be the smartest, you don't have to be the most talented, you don't have to be the best looking. If you just believe in your head that you can do something, you can do it, that's it. It's that simple. And it's so simple that most people never get it. That's, that's why I said when you look at a lot of these artists on stage, the only difference between them and a lot of other people, because once you put yourself out there, somebody's gonna criticize you, they just keep doing it. They don't quit. You just do it and do it. Whether you're a chef, whether you wanna become a fireman, whether you wanna become a school teacher, whether you wanna become a rock star, in any genre of music, just believe in your head that you can do it. And if somebody criticizes you, know that you're in good company because they've criticized every single artist that has ever been here on the planet. Led Zeppelin won. Rolling Stone said they can't write songs. Uh, somebody said that Kiss was a joke and they'll never last. Who knows who he said it? 40 years ago! And so these bands are out there doing it. Every single band from the Beatles to the latest artists get criticized. But they don't, you know, nobody likes to get criticized, but it doesn't matter. If that happens to you, know you're in good company, but it's all in your head. Just believe it. You just believe that you can do it. You set a, a plan and you don't quit. That's all that it takes. That's what I did with the double. I, I finished this. It was in my head. I brought it to a guitar. Um, I love Dean guitars. I cannot say enough about the company. What did you guys do today? You, you, this is California. You can do anything. It's nice outside. I mean, I, I have a friend in Poland. It's snowing there right now. You can do anything you want. You chose to come here. You did it. You finished it. I just like to say this. I'm going to take a couple minutes to chill out. I have CDs here if you're interested. I even got these cool koozies that you can put your beer in. It's got my little logo on there and stuff. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, and if you're interested in any of the guitars, you can ask Gary Harrison, or any of the great people here at Pitbull Audio. It's a fantastic store. I'm very honored to be here tonight, and thanks to each and every one of you. I'm Michelangelo Badio. See ya! Thank you. Let's hear from Michael now. Big round of applause. Thanks, Mike. He'll be back out here to sign some uh, posters and so on. Fantastic. Way to go, Mike. Uh, let's give away what we're going to give away in the meantime. I'll go get the bucket. I'll be right back. Did everyone put their raffle ticket in the bucket? Did everyone get a raffle ticket that's here? If you, you did not? 
uh, go on over to the counter. Let's put one in here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to draw for the shirts first. And the people that win the shirts, the tickets will go back in here. And okay, yeah, that's what there's a one fella here. So if you don't have a ticket, just walk on over to the corner of the counter, the corner of the counter, and uh, we'll get you a ticket. I've got maybe eight or nine T-shirts, different sizes. So if you want a particular size, let us know. Give us one second to get all the tickets in. All right. T-shirt wise, I got some double XLs for all you big people, and uh, I got. I only have double XLs. Yeah, I do have some XLs, and I do have some smalls for your small people. All right, here we go for the first T-shirt. I am going. I have drawn. Of course, they all should start with 1340, and then I got 866 for a T-shirt. 866. All right, all right. Come on up. I'm going to hold your ticket out for a minute. Hold on to that. What what size? You're welcome. Okay. Hold that ticket out. Put it back in in a minute. Next T-shirt. Next T-shirt is. 868 868 for a t-shirt here you go all right everybody here in the front what size hold on to that all right i got this part okay next t-shirt 876 876 come on up all right Hi, sir. Second. Next T-shirt. All right, here we go. Eight fifty one. Eight five one. I got eight five one. Eight five one. Eight five one. Going once. Oh, eight five one. We got eight five one. That is double XL. Extra large size. Extra large. All right, hold on to that. All right, next t shirt. Go, here we go. 875. 875 for a t shirt. 875, is 875 out there? Here comes 875. All extra large and double X. Hold on to that. All right, next. T-shirt, 843. 843, you got 843? <laughs> All right. All right. All right, 843 is a winner. Go one more time. Uh, 881. 881. Slim Pickens. It's small and double extra large. Two ends of the spectrum. All right. Ticket that was 80. Grab for another one. Uh, 826. 826. All right. All right. Last t shirt is. 855. All right. Back in here. Adam. Yeah, big round five.
for the DB driven with probably a retail value five hundred bucks or something. Getting pretty generous here. The number that wins the DB driven is one three four zero eight seven three. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's have a big round of applause for the winner. Seven three eight seven three. We have a winner, Anthony. Congratulations! All right, way to go, Anthony. And Anthony, we want to get a picture with you a little bit later too. Okay. All right. By the way, I've got a ton of posters also out here for you all to take with you. So um, uh, you probably saw them on the way in. Michael's back. He'll he'll uh, 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 sign some autographs if you like. Sign some posters if anyone's interested in any of these guitars. I'm up here. We're making deals today. So um, Michael will sign the guitar if you're interested in a purchase as well. So let me know. Maybe the guitar that Michael played. Maybe. One of those he did not play, and he'll sign. So thanks a lot, you guys, for coming out. Thank you very much for taking your time and your evening to come out and visit with us. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.